Well, welcome everybody to Emmanuel Baptist Church. We're glad you're here. I don't know about you, but for me and my family, this seemed like a, a shortened week. Our um, kids were on their school break this week, so immediately after church last week, we left, went out of town for a couple days, uh, went down to West Virginia just to enjoy the fall colors, which we weren't quite there yet. We were still about two weeks away from some really good fall colors. So the highlight of our getting away was visiting the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. So I don't know, my teenage kids thought that was like the greatest thing ever. Like, let's visit a lunatic asylum. Now Darcy is thinking if she can go and spend the night there sometime. It's not an active lunatic asylum, it's more of a museum, but it's just kind of a weird thing. So, so we enjoyed that and coming back, it was just kind of a weird way to re-engage with the rest of life because, yeah, just some weird stories in that, but has nothing to do with what we're going to talk about today. So, <laughs> um, well, as Pastor Greg shared earlier, we are continuing on in our series on Ephesians, um, and I don't know about you, but I, I've enjoyed this quite a bit, um, and in some ways... I wish that we were, were going to spend a lot more time in it, because there's just so much in it. I don't want to spend too much time by way of, of going back and rehashing what we've already talked about, but you've seen this slide before, and it's just a good thing to let you know where we are and where we're going in this study, but thank you. I was supposed to say this at the very first thing. If you did not get a set of notes on the way in... Uh, raise your hand or uh, they'll do that. So the notes and the bulletins were somehow separated from each other. So they weren't passed out at the same time. So make sure you get a set of notes. Because like always, I always have a lot of things that you have to fill in. So, but. so where we have been and where we still are are in the, these first three chapters where it is talking about enjoying God's triumph. It's what God has done, is doing, and is going to do through Jesus, uh, in Jesus and through the Spirit. It, he's restoring, reclaiming all things for himself. Um, and that's the first three chapters. And then those next three chapters are really how we as people can live that out, how we can proclaim uh, God's triumph. And so today we are... Still in that first part, we are starting chapter 3, and so if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Ephesians chapter 3. Um, if you don't have it, that's all right. Uh, most of the scriptures that I'm going to be talking about will be up on the screen. Um, and if you've been following along with us in this, uh, each chapter there is a, a verse that we are memorizing together, and we started off this morning doing our verse verses for chapter three and they really kind of get to the heart of this that that God's intent in all this is for his church uh, to be displayed um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today since these verses these memory verses for these couple weeks um, are out of this passage we're going to talk about today so I won't have us redo them again together but uh, I do encourage you uh, to at least make an effort and try to learn these verses. Um, you'd be surprised how, as you learn these things, God will bring them to mind uh, at sometimes just the right time um, to encourage you and to help you kind of process this life that we're in. But So as we jump here into chapter 3, uh, I would say it's a good time for us to have a reminder that every word of Scripture is good and useful and important. As we studied a few months ago in 2 Timothy, uh, we talked about how all Scripture is breathed out by God and is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness. That all of scripture is there so that we as God's servants uh, may be equipped for the good works that he's called us to. Um, 
So every word of scripture is good and it's useful. And sometimes we need that reminder, and I think this passage is one of those where it's helpful to have that as a reminder, uh, because sometimes reading Paul can feel maybe a little bit like this. I don't know if you can, how well you can see that, but I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the Family Circus comic strip. Uh, and it's a pretty regular feature in there where it shows the paths of the kids that are going through. And in this one, uh, the oldest son, Billy, is getting off the school bus, which is represented up there in the upper left-hand corner. And as he gets off the school bus, he's just doing a whole bunch of different things. He's climbing fences, playing with dogs, going down a slide, um, helping out with a neighbor, working on his car, helping get things out of a, a neighbor's trunk, just a whole bunch of stuff. And then he finally shows up at the front door, and his mom says, Billy, I've been worried about you. Where have you been? And Billy just said, just walking home from the bus stop. You know. He made it to his end point, but he had hit a lot of extra things along the way. Um, and like I said, sometimes it feels like reading Paul can be a little bit like this. Uh, Paul, in all of his letters and all of his writings, as he's led by the Holy Spirit, has a purpose for writing. There's something that he wants us to get out of this. Um, but if you read his stuff, his sentences are really, really long. And then he goes off on these little, they're not really tangents. They're, they're little sidebars. And each one is good and it's fitting. And each one has a whole bunch of richness of depth in it, or something that we need to learn, that God wants us to, to take to heart. But sometimes for us as a reader, it feels like he's just kind of wandering and meandering through this. And you're like, where is he going with this? Uh, and he eventually lands the plane and gets to the point. Uh, but sometimes we miss the good stuff along the way. Uh, so which is why in your notes that you have there, I, I call this, this little section, this passage, I digress. But not really. Um, so if you have your Bibles again, turn to Ephesians chapter 3, and we'll read the first uh, 13 verses. Um, we said if you don't have your Bible, uh, or if you don't even have one, talk to me afterwards, we'll make sure we get you one. Uh, but if you don't, or if you have a different version from the ESV where it might be hard to follow along, uh, you can follow on the screen with us. Um, so Ephesians 3, verses 1 through 13. Um, and if you wouldn't mind forwarding these as I go along, uh, that would be helpful. So follow along with me. It says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, and it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ, promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him, and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, 
which are your glory. Pray with me. Father, we come before you this morning thankful for your word. Thankful that your word has things to teach us. That it has ways to to rebuke us, to encourage us, to train us up in the way that we should go. And so, God, I pray that this morning that, that we would recognize your presence here with us, uh, that we would allow you to teach us from your word. Uh, that each of us, whether we have uh, been students of your word for many, many years, or whether this is all brand new, uh, would have ears to hear uh, what you have to say. Father, as always, I pray that, that I, uh, as the person up here, will not get in the way of what you have to say, but that you would uh, use my words to speak your truth, uh, and that all else would be forgotten but that all of us, including myself, would walk away from this changed and more like your son. Uh, so thank you, Father, for this day uh, and for this time that we have together. So we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, these 13 verses that we read are full of a lot of stuff. Uh, and there's really no way that we can unpack all of it in the short time that we have together this morning. Um, uh, but as I frequently do, as I uh, prepare for a sermon, um, I try and listen to sermons of other people, um, both just to kind of check to make sure, like, am I, am I getting the same things out of this as, as other people are? Am, am, am I headed in the right direction? Uh, and sometimes I do that just, you know, maybe like you at times kind of get stuck and like, really, where, where, what? What is the point of this meandering thing? And kind of help bring me on task. But, and like I said, we're not going to get through all, everything in these 13 verses. Um, Alistair Begg, he has six sermons just on these 13 verses. Um, John Piper has about 12 sermons on these 13 verses. If you're familiar with Martin Lloyd-Jones... Uh, he had 99 sermons just on the first three chapters all along. So there's a lot in here that we could do. Um, so today, my goal in this is uh, to highlight really what is the, the heart of what Paul is getting to in this um, so that, that we can walk away from this clearly understanding what what scripture has to say, why it is in there, and how we can hopefully walk away from it uh, a little different, a little more like Jesus. So it doesn't make us as a church any less spiritual because we're, we're doing what some people do in six or 12 and doing it just in one. And really, it's a way for us to, to encourage one another that we all should be spending more time in God's word, right? So, just as a side note, I know this was mentioned before, but I hope you are taking advantage of using uh, the Bible study journal that, that we put together uh, for this. Um, you know, we've encouraged everybody to kind of study the passage in the week leading up to the, the week that it, the sermon's going to be preached. So, in some ways, you can come in more prepared for what you're going to hear and, and then maybe in some ways be able to say you know i got this out of that um, but that wasn't mentioned up front and 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 that would spark some really good conversations between you and other people within the church so um, so if you haven't done that uh, i encourage you to do that uh, whenever you can and come up again tonight um, as we discuss it Anyway, all right, let's jump into the text here a little bit. So Paul begins this section here with a very familiar transition. 
He says, for this reason, which means he's connecting what he said in the previous section or in the previous chapters to what he's about to say right here. So he's going to connect what the Father has done and is doing and is going to do with what he's about to do. And, and what he's about to do is launch into a prayer. And he starts off this way, For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, and if you read ahead there in verses 14 and 16, that's where we, we recognize that Paul's going to pray. He's going to share a prayer that he has for this. Um, but before he kind of gets to the content of that prayer, he kind of pulls a billy and goes off on a little detour. It's almost as if his reference as a prisoner for their sake compels him to clarify the significance of that situation that he finds himself in and why that's important and why they sh should care. Maybe he thought that some people would assume that because Paul's in jail that somehow his message must not be that worthwhile. I mean, you know, why should we listen to this guy? I mean, after all, he's in jail, right? Uh, He's sitting in a Roman prison, and surely he's not the type of person that God would expect us to listen to. So maybe he's anticipating that. Or maybe he's thinking that some people might be discouraged or fearful that Paul's in jail. Uh, after all, if it can happen to him, it could probably happen to them, right? Um, they might be saying, oh my gosh, if they can put him in jail, what's going to happen to us? So whatever the reason that Paul starts off with this personal reference, he takes a short little pivot. Right? He digresses a bit to talk about God's plan, which really isn't a digression. It's, it's a really good and a meaty part of it. So, so he goes on to talk about this mystery, as he puts it, and his role in it. But although verses 2 through 13 are this brief detour prior to getting to his prayer, uh, they still have a lot of deep truths in it uh, that we need to understand. And so with the time that we have left, I want to share four things about Paul's digression in this. The what, the when, the who, and the why. And so as I said, and as you'll see, that these aren't really a digression, just a side door to the larger points of the entire letter here. Um, and so just a small disclaimer for those of you who, who like doing things a certain way. I'm going to pull these what, when, who, and why out of order from the way that it's written here in the passage. So uh, I hope that doesn't throw you too much, but... But let's start with the what. So your first set of, of, of blanks that you could fill in there are the what. It's the mystery of salvation. So at the heart of these 13 verses is this mystery that he talks about. And he uses the term mystery in verse 3 and in verse 4. He also used this term way back in chapter 1 and verse 9. Um, where he says, uh, and he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. Now I need to say this, the term mystery does not refer to something that we're kind of used to hearing. Or it's not the, the common way that we think about mystery when we often hear it. I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, uh, I used to love reading Encyclopedia Brown books. Or, and I had probably 40 Hardy Boy books. Um, as a teenager, I started reading a little bit more. So I, I liked Sherlock Holmes and Agatha Christie novels. And so I like a lot of the Agatha Christie movies that are out these days. Um, as I found G.K. Chesterton, I liked uh, Father Brown Mysteries and the, those shows that are on PBS as well. 
And I still love watching movies that are mystery-driven. But that's not the type of mystery that Paul is talking about here. One where you have to search out evidence and, and deduce certain things to uncover information that you probably weren't intended to know. You know, when, when, when somebody murders somebody, they're hoping that you don't figure out their mystery, right? Well, that's not the type of mystery here. A mystery in Paul's vocabulary is a bit different and has a very specific meaning. In Paul's vocabulary, a mystery is a truth that was unknown or hidden in the past that becomes known as God reveals it to people, either directly or through time and history. So it's a truth that was unknown or hidden that is revealed, that God reveals. It's not something that is brought out by one's own ability to deduce or figure out, but it's something that God reveals. And here in verse 6, it's the first time that Paul really clearly defines what he's getting at when he uses this term mystery. So what he's referring to are this, these three things. And again, here in verse 6, it says, the mystery is that through the gospel... The Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and shares together in the promise in Christ Jesus. He's unpacking a little bit here what he wrote about in chapter 1 and verse 10, and what he wrote about in chapter 2, verses 14 through 19. He's putting some flesh on this concept of what, what this mystery is. So that which was once only made available to God's chosen people, the Israelites, the Jews, that is now available to everyone, Jew and Gentile. And the mystery is that through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, Non-Jews, you and me, are heirs with Israel, God's chosen people. And it's not just that, that they get added to the will. You know, it's not just that they're, they're heirs and they're also going to get something else. You know, like my, my kids are or heirs to whatever minuscule stuff that we'll leave for them. My dad used to say that I was the, not the heir to his fortune, which he doesn't have, he used to say that I was the heir to his fortune. I, I, I'm not sure what that meant, but I took that as a positive, but as I got older, I wasn't quite sure. But anyway, I digress. Um, so the first part of this mystery is that they are equal heirs together with Israel. And like I said, it's not just that they are just added to the will, but that they are equal. It's not that non-Jews get 5% while the Jews get 95%. It's that everybody will share in what is to come. That was a truth that, that was a mystery that was unknown to them before. The other part of the mystery is that Jews and Gentiles are part of the same body. They are one new person. This is the tearing down of the wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles that are talked about there in chapter 2. You know, where, where Paul says that out of those two groups, Jew and Gentile, God is making a totally new and distinct people through the work of Christ on the cross. That they are equal members of one body. It's not just that they are coming together and they are at peace with each other, which they are, but they're coming together to form something new and unique and distinct that are God's own. That they are one body. And the third part of this is that they are equal shares together with the promise. 
the mystery is that Gentiles are sharers in the promise, the same promise that God's people were given. And it's not just a, a promise of blessing or the hope of eternal life, which is true. I mean, those promises are there. This has a lot to do with the receiving of the Holy Spirit, as, as Jesus promised before he ascended back into heaven. If you go back and read John chapter 14, uh, verses 15 and on through the end of the chapter, you see a lot where, where, where Jesus is promising to send the helper, to send the Holy Spirit. Actually, let me turn there real quick. John 14 says in, in verse 15, If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. And then later on, uh, verse 25, and all this I have spoken while still with you, but the counselor, or the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. There's the promise of the Holy Spirit. And it's not just God's Spirit for his people, but it's God's Spirit for all of us who come to God in Christ Jesus. Paul talks about this as well in Galatians chapter 3, where he says, so by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. So Paul's making it really clear that this mystery that he's been talking about is that the Gentiles, the people who weren't a part of God's promises, the people who weren't going to be heirs uh, of the things that Israel was promised, the people who were outsiders and foreigners are now all one. And that, that, that can happen because of Jesus. Well, that's the what. And there's so much more that we can say about this. Uh, we, we have talked a little bit about it as we, we, as we hit on chapter 2. Um, but there, there's a lot more in it. But that's the what. So let's move on to the when. So just as I said, in, in Paul's vocabulary, the mystery is that it's a truth that was unknown or hidden in the past that becomes known as God, as God reveals it to people either directly or through time and history. So if the inclusion of the Gentiles into God's family is a truth that was unknown or hidden and has been now revealed, when did this become a reality? So the when I'm calling it, because you know, I think I'm really witty, is that I'm calling it the history of the mystery. So here are three things about the history of this mystery. The first is that it was always a part of God's plan. If you remember back in chapter 1, verse 4, it says that he chose us before the creation of the world. And 1, 5, it says that we were predestined to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ. See, this plan of salvation, this plan of God for people like you and me to be included in all of this didn't originate after the fall of man when Adam and Eve disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden and that sin and death were introduced into the world. It wasn't then that God said, ah, well, maybe I should do something for other people. Nor did the inclusion of Gentiles into God's saving plan, what was the, that wasn't a response to Israel's rejection of him through the law, as we see in the Old Testament. This plan was something that was there before the foundation of the world. It was his, always his plan to send Jesus to purchase salvation through his for his people through his death. And that to me blows my mind that why God, before he even created the world, 
would still do it knowing what he would have to do to bring his created being back into a relationship with him. The fact that he knew before he even spoke it into existence that, that he would have to send his son to die for us, that's amazing. If I knew in advance what something was going to cost me and it was going to be that high of a cost, I'd find some other way to do it, or I'd look for some other way to do it. But this was always a part of God's plan. This just wasn't something that just came up through history. But then the when is that this was foreshadowed throughout the Old Testament. I'm going to throw some verses at you that you're going to write down. We're not going to turn to, all, to, to these. But Genesis 12, 1 through 3, and the call of Abraham, or call of Abram, says that through you, Abram, all the nations of the world will be blessed. I'm sure when Abraham heard this, he's like, well, I don't know what that means, but yeah, that sounds good. As long as I get, you know, what you're promising me, I'm glad other people get something out of it. But later on, Genesis 22, after Abraham is tested with Isaac, God reiterates the same thing, that through him all the nations would be blessed. The same thing is affirmed with Isaac in Genesis 26, 4. Then it's reaffirmed with Isaac's son Jacob in Genesis 28. In Isaiah chapter 2, the writer says that many nations will call on the Lord. Isaiah 49, Isaiah was told that he will be a light to the Gentiles. Isaiah 56 says that they should let no foreigner say that the Lord will exclude me. Hosea, chapter 1 and chapter 2, talks about that those who are not my people will be called my people. This is all foreshadow of what now has become a reality in Christ Jesus. That people who weren't given the promise are somehow going to be included in the promise. I have a little bit more to say on this uh, in, a, in a minute. But it was foreshadowed there in the Old Testament. It's now revealed in the Spirit. It was unknown and not understood to people in the past. As verse 5 puts it here in chapter 3, it was not made known to men in other generations. And it has, been, it has been made known now. So in this foreshadowing and for these other things, there are indicators that were there, right? That these other nations would be blessed. That they're going to call on the Lord. That, that God would include them. That they would not be excluded. But I'm sure Abraham had no idea what that meant. You know, would it be that he, as the blessed person by God, who is going to be given the land and, and, and all this stuff, would that just be that somehow that he would be a person who could provide food and resources and other things to other nations? You know, it's kind of an example of how we as America have been so richly blessed that that we can be an economic blessing or an inspiration of freedom to, to other nations, right? Maybe that's all Abraham thought that, that God meant by that. Abraham didn't know. The Old Testament prophets didn't know what it meant that many nations would call on God. Maybe they thought that they would just call on God out of repentance or out of recogni recognition that, you know, they were below his standard, and that they weren't a part of his people, but they would still 
acknowledge him as the true God. They didn't really quite fully understand what that meant. But Paul says that now, at this time, at the right time, the Spirit revealed it to them. It was the right time because Jesus had come and he had died as a sacrifice for the sin of mankind. So the history of this mystery is that it was always a part of God's plan, that it was hinted at in the Old Testament, but it has now been revealed by the Spirit because of what Jesus has done. There's a little bonus that you could add in there. It's not a spot for it in your notes, but Jesus also hinted at this pretty clearly in his ministry and in his parables. And at one point, Jesus said that you know, he initially came for the lost sheep of Israel. Um, but you'd see that throughout his, his, his ministry, and especially as it was winding down and heading toward the cross, um, he turned a lot of his attention to Gentiles. Um, Matthew 21 through 28, there's so many references to his engagement with, with the other peoples around him and, and talking about the rest of the world. His interactions with the Roman centurion, uh, whose servant was healed, with a demon-possessed man, with a woman at the well, with a Canaanite woman, just some of the examples of how he was there to not just serve his own people, but to serve the other nations as well. Jesus said that his house would be a house of prayer for all nations. And if you read his parables, Matthew 21 and Matthew 22, there are two pretty clear parables that are talking about how Gentiles would be included in God's kingdom. This mystery was always a part of the plan. And it was because of what Jesus did that it has been revealed. And I, well, now we can even understand it. So the third thing here, in addition to the when, but the who... Who are the participants in this mystery? So we have a couple spaces just for some of them. First one is the Godhead. Obviously, God has something to do with this. And all three persons of the Trinity are present, are represented in his plan of salvation. It was the Father's plan from the beginning. It's his wisdom, his plan, his gift of grace to Paul that we read about. His calling of him to be a servant and to proclaim the good news. And as the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And we are shares in the promise of him. We are shares in the promise of the Holy Spirit. It's revealed by the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who gives us wisdom and understanding. How about to take it? This isn't just something that was done by Jesus. And it's the plan of God accomplished by Jesus and then made known and revealed through the Holy Spirit. There's this very Trinitarian. We serve one God who works with three persons. And he is very clearly seen in all this. So it's the, who the, the Godhead. The second one is Paul and the Apostles. Um, the message, the truth of the mystery is for anyone who will receive it. But the initial revelation of it, the initial understanding of it came through those called to reveal it, to proclaim it. Verse 5, it says God's holy apostles and prophets. Verse 9, the grace was given to Paul was to preach the gospel to the Gentiles and to make it plain to everyone. When you think about the, uh, the apostles and the prophets and what they did in helping to get this mystery out into the rest of the world, 
Now, tradition tells us that Andrew, the disciple, took, gospel, took the gospel to eastern Turkey and to Georgia and to Ukraine. That Mark, the author of the gospel of Mark, took the gospel to Egypt. That Thomas, and tradition tells us that Thomas took the gospel to India. That, that Paul is an apostle. And, his, and the other prophets, the other apostles, were the ones who, God initially gave this message to, this understanding to, this revelation to, so that they could take it out and make it known to everyone. And it's because of what they have done that you and I are here and that we have it and can pass the torch on to other people. And then the third player in this, third participate, participant in this is the church. You see that in verse 10. It says, now, his intent was that now through the church. And I like the, the I like to emphasize the now in this um, because it kind of goes back to verse 5. Um, which was made known to men in other, which was not made known to men in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Holy Spirit. But the church, this is who we are. This is the one new person that God has created for Himself, out of the Jew and Gentile. The one new person is the church. The church is the ultimate expression of the wisdom of God. It is the community where God makes his wisdom apparent. The church is at the center of God's unfolding purpose in history. The church is the visual aid of God's purposes. See, people will look at the church. The people will look at you and me. And they'll either see what God is doing, or if we are not a reflection of what God has done and is doing in our life, then they're not going to see it. But the church, the reason we are here, the reason we are called to unity, the reason we are connected in oneness to God and to each other, is to be, expression, to be the expression, to be the example of God's wisdom to the rest of the world. A little bonus in this one as well is that this passage, it talks about the rulers and authorities in heavenly realms. And I wish we had more time to actually talk about this. Um, but Paul doesn't say how the church influences cosmic powers. Um, but he does say that his intent through the church is that his manifold wisdom of God would be made known to rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. I think we can only guess how it is deemed important for the heavenly realms, for these rulers and authorities to know God's manifold wisdom and how exactly we as the church do that. You know, in chapter 2, verse 6, it says that in Christ that we already live in the heavenly realms, uh, but there really seems to be more to that. And there's something to be said about what we do here communicates to and influences those spiritual beings, spiritual forces that we don't necessarily see. And we're really, there's a lot more to unpack in this, uh, but for sake of time, uh, we can't do that here. Um, but these are the players. God has done this. That, the Paul, that Paul and the apostles, it was revealed to them, and they have shared it with us. We have received it as the church, as we come to Christ. And it is our job to, as well to make that known and to pass that on. And the last thing I want to look at, in just the few minutes I have left, is the why. And I'm going to give you three points of application. Um, and there are 
probably many, many more points of application that you can get out of this passage. Um, I just want to give you three, and these were the three that I took away from this uh, as I studied it this week. The first one is this, that no one is outside of God's grace. You read verses 7 and 8. I became a servant of the gospel by the gift of God's grace given to me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all of God's people, this grace was given to me. Paul was an odd choice for God to reveal this to him. I mean, in some ways, I mean, he would have hated the Gentiles. He was a Pharisee. He was one of those religious leaders who thought it was his job and obligation to, to defend the Jewish faith and to, to get rid of those who he thought were blasphemers of God. And as a Pharisee who understood and, and at least he thought he understood what was being said in the Old Testament, he would have seen Gentiles as dirty, unclean dogs. You can read his testimony a little bit in Acts chapter 22. Verse 4, he says, I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them in prison as also the high priest and all the council can testify. I even obtained letters from them to their brothers in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. Paul was a religious guy, but he was not a good guy for this. And the point I want us to get out of this is No matter what you've done in your life, no matter what wrong things you've done, no matter what you've said about God or to God, no matter what you've been through, what your past looks like, your family situations, your hurts, your frustrations, You're never beyond the reach of God's saving grace. If someone like Paul could be given grace by God, there's nothing that you can do to go beyond the reach of God's grace. That you can be included in this as well. Another application point is that division has no place in the church. The reality that God has brought everyone under the same umbrella should completely change the way that we relate to one another. Racism or divisions of any part are completely contrary to everything that God has designed. If he has torn down the dividing wall of race between his chosen people and all other people, then why would we think that it's okay to put them back up in some way or shape or form? There is really only one race among believers. There's one person now in Christ. That's not to say that there isn't benefit or beauty in the diversity that we all have in our different backgrounds and our different ethnicities. The fact that we all come together as one in him means that there should be no reason, no excuse ever for us to to turn away from or to shun or to speak ill against somebody else just because of their different background, their different race, their different ethnicity. God doesn't see it that way. Neither should we. And the, the last why, the last application point is So don't be discouraged in suffering. Jesus is worth it. Paul was in jail. That's how he identified himself at the very beginning. But if you look back at his response in verse 13, he says, don't be discouraged because of my sufferings for you. They are for your glory 
Paul's sufferings were to be for the glory of other people. Because of his sufferings that he was able to communicate the gospel to them and they were able to come into this relationship with them. And when you know who has called you, when you know what you are called to, there is no need to be discouraged when you find yourself in a situation that looks hopeless or helpless or without an answer. Because God has you there. And all these things, these promises, you being an heir, you being a part of the body is never going to change no matter how your situations change. And maybe your suffering is for the benefit and the glory of other people. Maybe your suffering will help somebody else come to know Jesus. So don't be discouraged when you find yourself in that situation. Trust the God who has called us. Live in that. And encourage other people with it. I should close with that, but I'm just going to throw in one last little bonus that you don't have space for in your notes as well. But the bonus is that as it says here in verse 12, that we can approach God with freedom and confidence. If we are his, if he has called us and saved us and adopted us and made us his very own, we did nothing to earn it, right? It was all on him. And if all those things are true, and they are, There's nothing that we can do that can increase his love for us. So why should it ever hinder us from going to him? If he's the one who picked us out of it, that means he wants us, right? We talked about this later in chapter 1, that we are his inheritance. Because of that, then we can go to him in freedom and confidence. He will hear us. He will care for us. He will comfort us in it. He may not take us out of it. He didn't take Paul out of it. But we can go to him and trust him with it. So I pray that as we take time in God's word, and even as we try and kind of navigate through Paul's meanderings here uh, in this, that we would take some of these truths and apply them to our lives. And if you're somebody today who's never put your hope and your faith and trust in Christ, you don't know what we're talking about in this, or if you felt that you are outside of God's grace, come find me. Talk to me after the service. Talk to Pastor Greg or Van or Will or somebody else in this church. There's a lot of people in this church who can help you understand how God's grace applies to you how we can share it with other people. Father, thank you for your word this morning. Oh, there's so much in here. There's, there's plenty of things that we didn't even touch upon. But God, your word is true and it is for us. And so God, help us to live in these truths so that we can reflect you to one another, and to a world who needs you. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we get ready to leave, I want to encourage you all to come back out tonight. Uh, come and share with one another the things that you've been learning from this. Uh, there's, I so much enjoy getting to hear from other people and what they're getting out of these passages. So. Come, we'll spend an hour, we'll talk a little bit together, we'll share, we'll pray together. Um, So, and if you don't come tonight, share with somebody else. Share what God is doing in your heart and what you're learning from this. So, all right, thanks for coming. You're dismissed. See you soon.